Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. Before I continue, I want to mention that on July 26th at 3 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, I will be hosting a Zoom history conference about the 1913 white hurricane that hit the Great Lakes. It's a fascinating story, it's about an hour long, and it costs $5 to register, although it's free for my patrons. And you can be a patron for as little as $3 a month. Just visit patreon.com slash Canada EHX. Speaking of my patrons, I would like to mention that this episode is sponsored by Phil Maynard. And welcome to a new patron, Vic Hedges. On April 10, 1815, Mount Tambora in Indonesia erupted in the largest observed volcanic eruption in recorded history. The eruption was so loud it was heard 2,600 kilometers away, and it would send 41 cubic kilometers of dust and rock into the atmosphere. On the Volcanic Explosivity Index, Tambora registered as a 7, one down from the highest rating, which is Mega Colossal. For comparison, Mount St. Helens and Vesuvius were rated as a 5, while Krakatoa was a 6. In human history, no volcanic eruption has registered as an 8, the closest being 26,500 years ago. It is believed the initial eruption of Tambora killed 70,000 people, followed by hundreds of thousands of people over the next two years. Why am I talking about something that happened in Indonesia on a podcast about Canada? Well, today's episode is all about the year without a summer, and despite Canada being 13,000 kilometers from Indonesia, the effects of the eruption were still felt. For Canada, this was not only known as the year without a summer, but the poverty year. The winter of 1815-16 was a normal winter for eastern Canada, but that wasn't the problem. It was the winter didn't seem to end. The impact of the volcanic eruption wouldn't come to Canada in 1815. It would be a good year before Canada started to see that something was different about the weather. In a news report on April 18, 1816 in Quebec City, it was stated, The country has all the appearance of the middle of winter, the depth of snow still between 3 and 4 feet, we understand that in many parishes, the cattle are already suffering from a scarcity of food. People and newspapers began to notice that something was wrong with the weather by May. On May 14th, the Quebec Mercury reported, We had a fall of snow this morning. The weather continues cold. During April and May, temperatures were barely above freezing. At 8 a.m. on April 10th, the temperature in Quebec City was minus 12, and the temperature at 8 a.m. remained below freezing from April 15th to 18th. In Montreal, the temperature was below freezing from April 10th to 17th. In Quebec City, the coldest 8 a.m. temperature for the month was minus 12.2, while the coldest 3 p.m. temperature was 5.6. On May 28th, the newspaper was reporting on the theories coming out of the United States for the lingering cold weather, and it was believed that the spots observed on the sun were causing the unusual cold weather on Earth. The next day in Quebec City, snow was falling something that had happened in the city on May 1st as well. For May in Quebec City, the coldest 8 a.m. temperature was minus 1.1, while the coldest 3 p.m. temperature was 2.2. By June, things were not improving. For the sheep in Quebec who were recently free of their wool, that was bad news as they began to die in the cold. The Montreal Herald began warning people that they had best start planting potatoes because it was possible the wheat crops of the summer could fail. Ice, described as thick as a dollar, killed vegetation, trees lost their leaves, and many newborn livestock died from the cold. The Montreal Gazette described migratory birds dropping dead in the streets in the cold. On June 7th, Reverend Frederick Dibley of Woodstock wrote in his diary, Cloudy and cold as winter. Snow squalls all day. The snow fell last night so as to cover the ground. Terrible indeed. Never knew snow in summer before. Never was there such weather, people plowing with their great coats on. The same day, the wife of Sir John Sherbrooke, the Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia, Lady Catherine, wrote in her diary about walking in her garden with a friend and how it was as cold as winter. Also on that day, two days of snow had finished in Quebec, and the Quebec Mercury stated in an article, We had a pretty heavy snow yesterday for an hour and a half. 
Some has fallen today. The wind is northerly, and heated stoves are not uncomfortable. Several birds have been found perishing in the streets. The temperature during the two days of snow averaged between 1 and 2 degrees. Montreal also reported snow on June 7th and June 8th, while Kingston stated there was snow on June 6th. On June 8th, Treadway Thomas Miles of New Brunswick wrote in his diary, Wonder to behold, the snow covers the face of the earth one inch deep, peas up in the garden, but appear very much alarmed at the sight of snow. Four days later, Thomas Mills, a farmer in Margaretville, would write in his diary, Cucumbers killed by the frost, very little grass. The cattle can hardly subsist. On June 10th, the temperature was starting to rise in Quebec City, reaching 14 degrees, but it would not last long. Out in New Brunswick, itself only 33 years old at this point, the colony government had to send money out to the counties that were dealing with severe financial shortfalls. At the time, in some of these counties, the cost of goods was skyrocketing, with a barrel of flour costing $30 or $545 today. Usually, a barrel cost $1 or $18 today. Many farmers in the colony couldn't feed their livestock and were forced to sell them rather than have them starve. In Nova Scotia, the ground was frozen hard enough in swampy areas for horses to walk on the ground without sinking. On June 17th, the Montreal Gazette began to feel optimistic about the summer finally arriving after a few days of warm weather. The report in the newspaper stated, The weather has assumed within these few days a favourable change, and we now begin to be sensible of the influence of the summer sun. Out west in the area of Manitoba, Peter Fiddler, a notable explorer for the Hudson's Bay Company, witnessed a terrible cold spell on June 5th that he described as a very sharp frost at night, killed all the barley, wheat, oats, and garden stuff above the ground except lettuce and onions. The oak leaves are coming out as if they are singed by fire and dead. The frost through the summer would kill the three grain crops of the new settlers of the Red River area, barley, wheat, and oats. Things seemed to improve in some areas of Canada from mid-June to early July, at least slightly. The Montreal Gazette would write on June 10th, The season has been retarded to a later period than remembered by the oldest inhabitant. We had a little snow on Saturday, yesterday was more mild, and the sun had the influence in the beginning of May, but it was very cold during the night. Serious apprehensions are to be formed of our ensuing crop. In Quebec City, the coldest 8 a.m. temperature in June was 1.1 degree, while the coldest temperature at 3 p.m. was also 1.1 degrees. Throughout July, the cold continued and the growing season by this point was three weeks behind. In order to prevent starvation, the governor of Lower Canada banned the export of crops such as wheat, flour, beans, and barley until autumn. In order to bring in crops, which were barely coming in at ports, Canadian harbours removed all tariffs on imports of wheat from the United States. The optimism would not last, and by the beginning of July, the snow had returned. The Quebec Mercury would report on July 9th that the cold weather had come back and lasted four days. Throughout the month, cold waves would hit at various times, falling down to one degree at some points. Food was becoming scarce enough that there were reports of people eating mackerel, pigeons, and raccoons. On July 15th, the Montreal Gazette printed a proclamation from Major General John Wilson, the administrator of Lower Canada. It forbid the exporting of wheat, flour, biscuits, beans, peas, barley, and grain until September 10th. Prince Edward Island would do the same, putting in a restriction for three months. At the same time, as 600 immigrants arrived at St. John's, Newfoundland, they were turned away due to a lack of food in the community. That same day, the Quebec Gazette stated, We are sorry to learn from the unquestionable authority that great distress prevails in many parishes throughout this province from a scarcity of food. Bread and milk is the common food of the poorer classes at this season of the year, but many of them have no bread. They support a miserable existence by boiling wild herbs of different sorts, which they eat with their milk. While all this was happening, people were trying to figure out why the weather turned so cold. As I said, some thought it was the spots on the sun, and that the sun was cooling, and that summer would not be experienced ever again. 
while others felt it was the punishment of God for people deserting farms for seaport jobs during the War of 1812. At the end of August, Lady Sherbrooke was on tour of Upper Canada with her husband and would write that there were two cold waves on August 21st and August 30th, describing very cold mornings but no mention of snow. Recordings on the mornings of August 21st and August 29th show that the temperature was 2 degrees and 4 degrees. The terrible cold seen through the summer can be seen by the detailed recordings of the weather observers in Canada. And I'm going to look at two of the most detailed here. The first is Reverend Alexander Spark of Quebec City, who arrived in Quebec in 1780 to work as a teacher and recorded daily weather readings from December 1798 to March 1819, missing only 20 days. In his recordings, he shows very cold temperatures from June 6th to June 9th. In an entry, he writes, The 6th, 7th, and today, bleak cold, very uncommon weather for this season. On the 7th, it snowed a little the whole day. At 10 at night, the ground was completely covered. The second observer was Thomas and John McCord of Montreal, who began recording the weather in January of 1813 and continued until 1842. In their records for June 1816, most of the daytime temperatures were just above zero to 10 degrees Celsius. The lowest temperature recorded in that month was 1.1 degrees on June 7th, with the warmest temperature coming during a brief warm stretch from June 22nd to June 24th, when the temperature ranged between 24 to 28 degrees Celsius. These would be the three warmest days of the summer. On June 25th, the temperature fell heavily down to 15 degrees. Thanks to these weather observations, as well as the Hudson's Bay Company, we can see today that from March to October 1816, each month registered an average temperature below the 10-year average. The months of March, April, May, June, July, and September were the coldest ever recorded at the time, and possibly to today. These months, in Quebec City at least, had average temperatures of minus 6.9, 2.7, 9.4, 17.5, 20.8, 17.8, and 12.5. In September, things had not improved, and the summer had come and gone, without there ever being a summer to speak of. Lower Canada by this point was dealing with total crop failures with four out of five crops ruined. The frost left the crops that did remain small and of poor quality. For many farmers, the only way to get food was to sell their cows to buy bread, or survive on wild herbs. The only crop that seemed to survive was rye, and only for farmers who practiced trial and error plantings throughout the summer. In the Red River colony, the price of grain rose heavily and caused severe distress for the poorer individuals of the colony. On September 12th, in Nova Scotia, a frost would arrive after a few warm days and destroy nearly all of the grain in the fields. From July to September in Quebec City, the coldest temperature for each month at 8 a.m. was 7.8, 7.2, and 2.2, while the coldest 3 p.m. temperature for each month was 11.1, 13.3, and 10. In the winter, New Brunswick would ban the export of any food harvested in the colony in order to keep its own citizens from starving. The Halifax Chronicle reported in December, it has been given us from the most authentic sources that several parishes in the interior parts of Quebec are already so far in want of provisions as to create the most serious alarms among the inhabitants. Every month in 1816 registered frost, which is incredibly rare. The effects of the eruption would diminish in the coming years, although snow was still seen in June in 1817. In that year, New Brunswick implemented a law that mandated the size and price for loaves of bread. The law stated that a shilling wheat and loaf had to weigh two pounds and four ounces. It was reported that the St. Lawrence River froze faster and farther down river than it at any point in the previous 50 years in 1817. It was also reported in the Nova Scotia Royal Gazette that men could slay far into the Northumberland Strait without seeing open water which it described as something not within memory of the oldest settler in the place. That winter would see many deaths. In Quebec City, the daughter of Marie Louisa Ballou would be found dead in the small home she lived in with her mother and sisters. 
The home had no windows, a hole in the roof for the chimney, and earth floors. The child died of a violent sore throat and cold produced by exposure to the frigid weather. Throughout this terrible winter, governments did what they could to help. Governments did provide relief with the government of Lower Canada providing about £15,000 or $2 million today in food. Newfoundland would purchase £100,000 of flour and Lower Canada also set aside a loan fund for farmers needing to buy seed. It wasn't always goodwill, though. When the Legislative Council of Lower Canada was told that the people of the Kamaroska region had eaten the last of their cattle and were starving, the Speaker of the Assembly argued that they should only receive an interest-free loan and that the region had enough to buy food of its own. The winter of 1817 lasted well into May, leaving 20% of the population of Canada with not enough food to eat. On May 1st, 1817, the citizens of Quebec City rode across the frozen St. Lawrence River in sleighs and carts and planted maypoles in the ice. Three days later, the ice broke, and soon 20 ships from Montreal appeared with seed grain for the eastern part of Lower Canada. Governor General Earl Dalhousie would say once fall came along, a finer season for seed time and crops generally never was known. All Canada, as well as this province, rejoices in the prospect we have at present. Things would not return to a true normal people were accustomed to until 1818 when the average monthly temperatures from March to September began to reach their usual averages. I hope you enjoyed that look at the year without a summer, and if you did, please give a rating and review. You can reach me by emailing craig at canadaehx.com. You can visit my website by going to canadaehx.com. You can also find a store where I have various products for sale that feature Canada and our many symbols. And you can support the podcast by going to Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Canada EHX. Information comes from Canada's History, Niche Canada, Early Canadian Weather Observers in the Year Without a Summer, Wikipedia, Reader's Digest, CBC, The History of the Methodist Church, Red River Colony, Maclean's, Weather Network, and Canada's Anglo-Celtic Connections. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.